Hi, this is Karen at the University of Idaho. Today we're going to talk about rangeland succession. Okay, you probably learned about succession in junior high or high school. But today we're going to think about those successional forces, the things that Mother Nature uses to, uh, re to allow ecosystems to recover from disturbance. And then we're going to think about how we might use those forces in rangeland management. So let's get started. Okay, remember, succession is really just a describe, description of how plant communities change over time in a directional way, how they, there's a succession over time of plant communities starting from you know, being disturbed or um, not having much vegetation to having a full complement of plants and animals in a community. There's two kinds of succession. The first kind of succession is what we call primary succession. Now, this doesn't happen a lot, but it occurs whenever the successional trajectories occur without soil. They start without soil, such as after a volcano, after a landslide, after a flood, or, or even as a water wet, wetlands uh, start to get soil and recover, and, and they've been covered by water, and now the soil starts coming in. So any of those would be cases where we're starting without soil and the plant communities are going to start recovering. The second stage is when you start to see not just bare soil, but you start to see non-vascular plants like lichens and mosses come in. And what those things, what those um, non-vascular plants do is they attach to rock and they start to break it down. And they also start to add more organic matter, making it a more um, pleasant place for other plants to come in and, and start to to grow and start to put down root. After many, many years, start to have some soil, and then we get into a stage or a series of stages that we would call early serial stages. A sear is a, is a point in a succession, so these are early serial stages. These early stages would usually have annual plants. Most of the plants would be herbaceous or not woody, and the plants would be what we call ruderal or they have invasive characteristics. They handle disturbance pretty well. They produce a lot of seeds. They really move out into a pretty marginal ecosystem. And again, over decades, as those plants grow, they add more organic matter to the soil. They make the community more hospitable to other plants. And eventually, and in the late cereal stage, we have a series of plants that are long-lived. They're perennial, like trees and shrubs would start to be part of the community in late cereal phases. Uh, the community is diverse, and it's not just plants, but it's communities of plants and animals that are um, living together. Uh, the animals are foraging on the plants. They're putting organic matter into the soil. They're changing the soil. And they're also come to, eventually come to a fairly stable community, which would be called the potential natural community. We'll talk a little bit more about that kind of end point of succession, which is called a potential natural community. Okay, a good example of primary succession that happened relatively close to home was when Mount St. Helens in Washington state erupted in 1980 created a vast landscape of barren terrain around it. And up in the right-hand corner, you can see a picture of Mount St. Helens shortly after the eruption. There was a pretty interesting article in a journal called Biogeosciences, which was by two researchers, Del Morel and Magnusson, and they were looking at a recovery of Mount St. Helens and another uh, volcano that we'll talk about in a second. So this is a, two figures from that article. And you see that on the left here is a, a figure from the plains of, of Abraham, which is a part, it's just on the edge of one of those benches of Mount St. Helens. And you can see it's completely not, not vegetated. There's no vegetation there right after the uh, eruption in 1980. And then about 30 years later in 2009, the, these authors went back and they looked at that site again. And now you can see there's some vegetation coming in, some small plants there, probably some of those invasive pioneer plants, but there's a, a sheen of green there. And there's probably also some animal activity which is helping this community to uh, kind of recover. So it's been 30 years, it's not a lot of vegetation there, but you can see it's much further along the successional phase than it was right after the uh, volcano erupted. Here's another example of primary succession. Uh, this is Surtsey volcano, which emerged from the North Atlantic Ocean just south off the southwest coast of Iceland. It was below the ocean surface, and then in 1963 it erupted, and it continued to erupt until 1967. And over that time, it created an island, you know, just off the coast. And here's a couple of pictures on the left-hand side is a part of that island that is still in really early stages of succession, just very few green plants there. On the right-hand side. 
you'll see the pioneer vegetation coming in along the edges of that of the volcano all this volcanic island what's interesting about this is one of the really important forces of succession here were, were animals this was near a colony of gulls so gulls came over from the mainland and they started nesting and 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 hanging out so in that process they brought organic matter over they brought um, seeds over and they kind of you know uh in accentuated succession so uh, we've talked a lot about plants in succession but this is a case where animals were a really important starter that got the succession and immigration of plants started so gulls were really important in recovery and primary succession on the Circe volcano island. Here's a video to give you a taste of. This is a classic image that is in several um, range man te management textbooks, and it, it kind of describes what succession, uh, how it occurs on rangelands. And what this uh, figure points out is that um, soil development, plant development ha happen in concert. So you start out with bare soil and the, and and no plants, and then you start to get these pioneer stages with the lichens, mosses, and and algae and that's when you have the very first stages of decomposition of that bare rock starting to form into small gravelly pieces and eventually into soil as you start to get into that first herbaceous stage what we had called low serial stages or early serial stages you get annual forbs you get little invasive annual grasses and, and and just shallow rooted forbs mostly annual but some perennials at this point the soil is gravelly it has very little organic matter. It has very little ability to hold water. As you get to a higher soil stage, what might be called the subclimax stage, those short grasses start to form. Now we start to get more perennials. Still, they're mostly herbaceous plants. We might get a few shrubs starting to come in over time. And as those plants come in and they put their roots down, they um, add some organic matter to the soil. So the soils become more fertile and they have increased water holding capacity again so the community is now becoming more hospitable to plants and over many many decades the rockiness of the soil will be converted to what would be a mall soil or a rich uh, dark um, organic matter rich soil and then we would get to what we call the late cereal stage the the potential natural community or the climax stage where you have dense stands of deep rooted grasses and some forbs uh, and maybe even some shrubs, depending on what the community is capable of producing. And at that point, you also have very highly fertile soils. So the point is that soils and plants are moving along in concert as you go from, from bare rock to that final stage, that potential natural community. What this graph doesn't describe is how important animals are in the equation, animals in the soil that break down uh, the rocks, you know, such as earthworms and stuff, and then also animals above the soil which also have physical activity and add organic matter to the system. Okay, I mentioned that term, potential natural community. This is the end point of succession. Historically, it was called climax. We tend to use that PNC or natural community more often these days. Uh, it's basically what the community will become based on the soil and climate that that plant community is, is evolving in or starting to, um, to success into. So in other words, uh, if you're in the Southwest, that community will um, might be a desert. If you're in the prairies and the plains because of the climate and because of the evolving soils, you might have grasses and prairies. Uh, in much of the mountainous areas where we have more, higher precipitation, uh, we would have trees in the form of forests. And then if you get in places like the tundra where they have the permafrost and they have very long cold winters, then the climax community or the potential natural community would be a low growing shrub and lichen based community. So again, where a succession will end depends on the climate and the soils on that one piece of area. Okay, in the beginning of this presentation, I said there's two kinds of succession and then I launched right into primary succession, which regrins on a, a rocky surface. So primary succession starts with, in a situation where there's no soil. And on the left hand side here, you can see that picture of Mount St. Helens where after the eruption, it was just lava and, and ash and other things, so, so not soil. The other kind of succession is called secondary succession. It begins after a disturbance that removes the plant community but leaves the soil intact. Okay, now depending on the 
disturbance, whether it's a fire or a landslide or the level of disturbance, the soil could exist in several different sites, but there's always some soil that exists on the site. So it's largely a status of, or a situation of reestablishing the plant community. So on the right hand side here, for example, you see a picture where a plant community is recovering after fire and you see the dead snags of trees. So secondary succession begins with soil. Here's a video that might be interesting that talks about secondary. Okay, let's focus a little bit more on secondary succession. Um, so secondary succession, again, begins with soil and the kinds of disturbance that would remove the plant community and leave just bare soil would be things like fire, sometimes really severe drought will do this, landslides, floods. There's a number of things that could happen on rangelands, even overgrazing, that could remove the plants and, and set you back in successional state. At that point, uh, pioneer species again become important. Herbace herbaceous plants, not woody plants, are the first ones to come in. And the plants that have what we call invasive characteristics, ones that have a lot of seeds, would be able to outcompete in situations that are pretty marginal. Those plants would come in. And then as you move to the right through these sears of succession, uh, in this case, to try to a situation where we're reestablishing a forest, we'd first have some little seedlings. So we'd start to have some long-lived species that would come into the situation. Uh, in plant C, we might have some of those species grow to maturity. Other species in the understory become expressed. And then in D, which would be the, the cereal, the final cereal stage, the, the potential natural community or climax community, where we're seeing a, a variety of plants and animals, high diversity usually, and stability, thinking of that as the final stages of secondary succession. I've used that word cereal stage or cereal. I just wanna make sure that you know that a cere is just a distinct plant community or a, a distinct community actually in a whole sequence of succession. So uh, again, going from pioneer plant communities and, and animal communities and moving all the way to potential natural community or climax communities. Each step along the way would be called a cere or a cereal stage. To get some more ideas about how secondary succession. Okay, now a little bit of review. Um, which of these examples below would be either primary or secondary succession? So if you had a prescribed fire that reduced juniper trees on rangeland, that would be an example where changes in the community would happen through secondary succession. You had a really severe erosion event that removed all the soil from a site and left just bedrock, just, just a, a slab of bedrock, that would be an example of primary succession that would be required to reestablish plant communities on that site. Overgrazing, such as even by uh, wildlife, such as elk or cattle on canyon grasslands, would be an example of secondary succession that would be required to recover the site. And all the restoration practices that a land manager might do, such as spraying cheat grass with herbicides and reseeding with a perennial grass, those restoration practices would be examples of secondary succession. It pretty, should be pretty straightforward. Okay, some basic ideas to kind of sum up here. One is remember that we're always going from really simple plant communities to really advanced. So simple plants, they die, they add organic matter. They're the ones that are able to somehow invade and be pioneers in really marginal situations. And then as time goes on, the soil layer thickens, those herbaceous plants, mostly grasses and forests, begin to grow. Plants and animals add nutrients to the soil. Those plants and animals have food webs and, and are starting to get more complex. Keep changing the site, adding more organic matter. And then more advanced, more long-lived plants, such as shrubs and trees, will start to move into the site and they can survive now because those earlier stages have changed the site. And then we start to see really complex food webs and interactions between insects, small birds, reptiles, mammals. They all start to inhabit the site and interact and as time goes on, become more stable. So that leads to some ideas about sort of the forces of change in nature. That it starts with immigration, plants, and animals moving into the site and being established in the site. Then there's competition, especially between the plants and, and sort of the plant that's most well suited for the site wins. And then there's site modification because there's been added organic matter, it changes the moisture and nutrients in the soil. And then the plants that exist continue to com compete 
and then the plant most well suited wins and there's this kind of ring of competition and site modification until it, over time over many years you get to a situation where the site that is the plants that are most well suited to the site because of the climate and the bed and the soil on the site they're the ones that become stable so those plants and animals that are best suited for that climate and that specific space really start to be the ones that dominate the site and then we see some stability and it's kind of the, the final stages of succession. Now let's take a look at those forces of succession and think about how we use them as humans to recover or promote succession. Uh, one example would be the, that first stage immigration and establishment. That, that's the basis of a lot of restoration practices. On the left here, there's a, a plot that um, was the, the vegetation was removed in the Holloway Fire in southeastern Oregon, and this was an experiment uh, where they were trying to reestablish the site, and it was an experiment that um, Dr. April Hewlett was involved in, and, the, and in this case, they're just trying to reestablish plants on the site. In the middle, you see some sagebrush plugs. One of the things that we'll do on sites is, is add some plants back into the site, such as with using sagebrush and, and actually putting plugs into the ecosystem. On the right side is a true axe drill. It's dr I'm sorry, it's a drill that's really established and really rugged, and it's it's designed to really get seeds onto rangeland sites, even really rocky sites. This true axe range drill can work. So these are ways that we, as humans, kind of get in the succession process and start to immigrate and establish plants into the into the site. Other things that we try to do is to try to modify uh, com competition in ways that benefit us to, you know, to get to the, the final plant community that we desire. On the left hand side, you'll see in the front, there's some green plants and those green plants are mostly crested wheatgrass that are quite well established. And then right behind that, there's a, a brown area. And this is an area where Dr. Hewlett was involved with an experiment where they were trying to reduce the competition of crested wheatgrass and allow some other plants to grow and increase some diversity. So they actually sprayed the, the crested wheatgrass because it's a really competitive grass. So in order to get other plants to establish, they sprayed with herbicides the crested wheatgrass. In the middle is a project that was done by the Sage Step project. Uh, Sage Step is a, is a multi-state project in the Pacific Northwest where they're trying to understand uh, plant response after fire. And in this example, they are um, doing aerial spreading of Tebuthyron, which is an herbicide, it's called spike, and it's an herbicide that kills shrubs. So what they're trying to do here is get rid of some of the sagebrush and allow some other plants to come into the plant community. So they're altering the competition, they're reducing sagebrush and allowing other plants to become established. On the right hand side is an experiment that I was involved in after a fire at the U.S. Sheep Experiment Station. We were looking if, at the idea that we could bring sheep in to reduce some of the grasses and increase the amount of sagebrush and and other plants on the site. So this was an example where we were using sheep grazing to change the competitive advantage of sagebrush. Another experiment, uh, a set of experiments were done in that sage step project that I mentioned, where they were trying to really try to, to, to kind of uh, change the, the organic matter and other things that affected the site. On the left-hand side, you'll see a pre-treatment picture where they, there's printing juniper in the background, and the goal was to get rid of some of that pinion juniper that was coming into the uh, sagebrush steppe ecosystem. In the middle, you can see that uh, they removed this, that pinion juniper. They did this by shredding. Uh, it's a device called a, a, a shrub hog, uh, and it, it just digs down and it uh, shreds up the sage or the uh, juniper. And you can see some juniper skeleton, skeletons there. So this brush hog just kind of reduced with physical force the pinion juniper, and in that process, it added a lot of sticks and organic matter to the soil. And on the right-hand side, you'll see the response to that additional of moistures and nutrients to the soil. Final stage is stabilization. And what we see in the, those final stages of stabilization is uh, examples of the hydrologic cycle and the nutrient cycle starting to be really active and starting to be somewhat stable from year to year. They certainly modify and, and don't change as much. From year to year, also the plant communities and the and the animal communities would have really extensive um, food webs, so those plants would reduce from change in change from year to year. So you start to see sort of plant communities and animals that are seen year after year on the site. 
then we know we're really close to that potential natural community because it's becoming stabilized from year to year. An important concept in succession is the idea of an ecological site, which we'll cover a little later in this class. But an ecological site is a product of all the environmental factors, such as the climate and the history, the soil, the, the bedrock that the community is, is laid on, and those factors that influence the development of soil and vegetation. This includes natural disturbances such as fire. So in other words, at any one place on Earth, there's only so many types of plants that might grow there and might survive and really might become a potential natural community. And that one place on Earth would be called an ecological site, something that has the ability to produce the same kind of soil and vegetation. Two other concepts that are important when we start thinking about succession is the idea of community resilience or community resistance. Resilience is the ability of a plant community to return to what it looked like before the disturbance. So what was its composition and structure before the disturbance? Some plant communities such as tall grass prairie on the right there, the top right, they are really designed to just survive disturbance. So those communities evolved with lots of grazing and lots of fire. And rather than trying to keep the fire and grazing from coming, they just let it occur and then they recover after it. Because as we talked about earlier in the class, they have meristems largely at the base of the plant. So when the fire or grazing comes through, they can recover. So they invest in strategies that allow them to recover from the disturbance. Community resistance is a little bit different. It's when a, a community has characteristics that give them the ability to avoid being disturbed, to avoid disturbance at all. So on the bottom, right there's an example of a, a sagebrush or i'm sorry a uh, a cactus and shrub community in the southwest southwest desert communities uh they invest in the plants invest in strategies to avoid being grazed they've got spines and and thorns so those are strategies that allow them to try not to be grazed there's also a lot of space between plants so fire is not very common so it's another way to kind of avoid having a disturbance in the plant community so in other words, some plant communities are really designed to recover after disturbance. Others are designed to try to avoid ever having to go through that disturbance. Now, to bring it all together, remember we've talked in the earlier in the class about the, the things that happen to plant communities on rangelands, grasslands, shrublands, woodlands. They've evolved with all kinds of disturbances, fire, herbivory, climate variation, invasion. And then newer factors such as human uses, development, fragmentation, recreation. Those plant communities have the abilities to deal with those disturbances and still produce ecological services that we want from the land, such as forage, wildlife habitat, biodiversity, carbon sequestration. So those are natural forces. Remember that what we do as humans are just to kind of engage in those natural forces and really put them under our control. So we do use fire. We use herbivory in the form of livestock grazing. We manage invasion uh, through weed management, for example. Um, there are human uses, but we try to manage those human impacts through, um, through changing the kinds of uses that humans use, zoning, regulation, travel plans, those kinds of things. And then also restoration would be another example where we try to uh, change the, the way that plants come into a community and just those actual successional forces that we've talked about. So these are all natural forces that we are using now to steward the land for stewardship. So those are some ideas for rangeland succession, uh, whether it be primary or secondary. Uh, it's something that's always occurring on the land and we as humans can embrace it and use those tools and at least we will know kind of what the plant community might change to over time.